Hi, I'm Nina Montiano, and I'm going to read a little bit about my new book, A Diary in the Age of Water. Uh, it has a really interesting history in that it started off in 2015. I was actually uh, commissioned to write an eco thriller about water, a political, socio political book for my publisher in Rome. And out came a little short story called The Way of Water. And essentially, I wanted to write something that was a little, I wanted to capture irony. So I picked water in Canada, and I decided that in this world, which is not too far from the future, um, Canada would be undergoing water scarcity. So I start off with a young lady who is actually thirst, dying of thirst in Canada. So there's the irony because, of course, Canada is such a water-rich nation. So out from that short story came this novel. And it's essentially a, a book about four generations of women over an extended time period during a time of great change. And it's looking at their relationship, their specific relationship with water during this time. So I'm going to read now from the beginning of the book. The book is parsed out as a diary, obviously. The, that's the title, A Diary in the Age of Water. And it begins not with the diary. Someone is going to be discovering the diary. It begins with this, this person. Her name's Keo, and she's heading to the library. Keo runs through the dying forest of the north the last boreal forest of the world. The rain earlier this morning left the forest dripping with living moisture and saturated the air with the scent of giant conifers. Their fragrance, fragrance is intoxicating, a fresh pungency that lingers like the smell of fresh water. The giant buttress trees rise like pillars out of soggy ground. They push past the mixed hardwood canopy and pierce the mist, announcing the future. Lichen drips off branches and clothes the fibrous trunks in crenulated patterns. Moss covers everything. A filigree of green, silver, and russet plays in the breeze, dancing like wild shadow. Tugged by the wind, Keo's hair flows behind her, like a dark, turbulent river, as she leaps over rough ground, her skirt flying. Her four dark blue arms stretch out for balance as she navigates the obstacle course of fallen trees, tall ferns, and horsetails. Already high in the sky, the sun is a large blushing orb that bathes everything in hues of pink. Nam calls it Gaia's heart light, a poem to heaven. Nam told her that the light was very different during the age of water, when the sun was sharper and shone brashly in a brilliant cerulean blue sky. Keo imagines this sky, the startling blue color of Nam's winking eyes. Nam, like Keo's other mentors, often only has two arms and flesh the color of the sand, not the electric blue of Keo's own skin. Despite their differences, she thinks of Nam like a mother and secretly wishes she looked like her old mentor. Keo stops for a moment to catch her breath and listen to the forest. Cardinals, robins, and thrushes warble and flute loudly as if complaining about destiny. Yet they are the interlopers. According to Mio, they took up permanent residence in the north where the climate warmed during the age of water. The birds that previously lived in the north had had nowhere else to go and had perished. Kyo runs on, gathering coherent waves of vibration, intent, and motion into one continuous and harmony, harmonious rhythm. She understands that rhythm embraces a fractal continuum that ranges from microscopic to cosmic proportions. Cell division aligns with the planet's circadian rhythms. Bees synchronize their flight with the phases of the moon. This all happens all through water. It is then that she feels her sisters the most, the other Kios, other blue beings like her, scattered over the world in small enclaves like hers. 
each whispers a harmonic tone in a soft symphony of wisdom. Frequencies from all over the world carried in the coherent domain of water vapor to resonate through her interstitial water. They are waiting for her. She shares their eagerness for the exodus, but she also harbors a secret yearning for the past, as though some hidden part of her is lodged there, like a tendril of a vine reaching across time, seeking resolution, redemption even. What is holding her back in this drowning forest? It isn't the trees. Keo understands that she's holding her sisters back with this selfish sentiment and preoccupation with a past and a people she has only dreamed of. How is it that she alone stands apart from the rest? It is not her lack of adventure or faith. She embraces her future. Nam calls her sprite, an endearment she knows, but no one but one based on Kyo's curiosity and yearning for adventure. If her mentor knew of Kyo's perverse and guilty obsession, she might call her something else, and certainly not with a wink. Kyo involuntarily swallows down a truth. She knows that her reluctance to leave has to do with the villainous water twins who destroyed humanity because of their hatred for their own kind. She feels an unreasonable longing, as though a cord were tugging her back to them. The water winds, uh, twins were the first ones and only ones from the water age who had the power to instruct water, and they did so long before the new children of the forest learned how. Keo is convinced that the water twins somehow spawned the children of the forest, those like her. She desperately wants to believe that the water twins somehow did the right thing in causing the storms and eliminating humanity from the planet. She keeps dreaming that she was there with the humans. Why is it so important to her? She stands up with a shrug, no matter. Today is the day she has been both dreading and anticipating for so long. Today she will finally learn some ecological history and make her personal atonement to Gaia, who must prepare for a new age. And then she, Keo, will transcend her current existence to make the exodus. Nam has instructed her this morning to go to the Age of Water Library, a journey that will ultimately take them all home. At the library, Kyo is meant to choose a work or else be given one by Ho, the librarian. She will commit it to memory before offering it in the water keeping ceremony, which will prepare them all for their final journey. She hopes she'll make a worthy choice. The door of the sacred library beckons through the dying sugar maple stand. It is a solid maple doorway embedded in the hillside covered in the shrubs. She approaches the solid door. And she knows, she picks a book. She knows that, sorry. She knows which book she wishes to study. It is clearly ambitious of her. Ho will be cross with her for pre presuming such an undertaking. The textbook is over a thousand pages. It will take her at least six months to learn it. Confident that she will convince the old librarian, Kyo glances back at the forest of her birth and pulls in a deep breath, committing it to memory. Then she reefs open the heavy door and enters the place she will spend the rest of her life on earth. Thank you so much.